our lovable animals. They come in so many forms, and they always seem to wiggle their way into our hearts. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And these are our incredible stories. Hello and welcome back to all of our listeners from around the world and across the United States. We're happy to have you here with us again for some more incredible stories. Now, if you happen to be a first-time listener, well, we're glad that you found us. And uh, if you like what you hear today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and join us each and every Friday for some more incredible stories. And I think that uh, no matter where you're listening to us from, whether it's uh, Europe or We have listeners in Vietnam, if you can believe that, Gary. I believe uh, it. uh, We have one uh, uh, listener in Russia Russia also. So wherever you may be uh, in the world, I think you will really um, glow a little bit when you hear our lovable animal story today. We have, uh, coming back to us, a very special guest. Would you like to introduce her, Gary? Yes, we have Esther back with us. Yes, Esther Luttrell. And Esther has been uh, our uh, fountain of information about all things Hollywood, but we're going to go on a different track this evening, and we're going to be talking about animals. And Esther, welcome. You're definitely an animal lover, dogs, cats, and you even for a brief time had a possum. (laughs) How true, how true. Sometimes I think there's so much we could learn from animals. Oh, yes. Don't you? Absolutely, yeah. without a doubt. Mm-hmm. How did the possum situation come about? Well, first of all, let me thank you all for having me in, even to talk about this. I really appreciate it. Um, it's our pleasure. Doesn't it just kill you to see how animals are so abused and so mistreated? Oh, oh yeah. Doesn't it just kill you? Oh, I can't yeah. stand it. Well, anyway, so you want me to tell you about my little possum? Okay. First of all, possums <laughs> have not been really in my frame of reference. <laughs> They're not exactly cute and cuddly. When I moved uh, where I am now in this house, I put the food out in little dishes on the back porch uh, for whatever animals came by. And I'm in you know, the heart of the city, but uh, I put a little dish or two back there. And I looked out, and there was a raccoon, and there was a possum, side by side. And uh, raccoons are kind of cute, but possums aren't. <laughs> <laughs> and it looked like kind of a young one to me. I mean, what am I? I don't think I'd ever seen a possum up close, but just kind of to me, I felt like he was young. And I called him Sweet Pea, and uh, Sweet Pea got where he would not run when I came, and and uh, I never tried to pet him. They're not cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I fed uh, the raccoon, and I fed Sweet Pea, and I still have a raccoon, and I still have a possum on my back porch, and they still eat there every night. But uh, I found out in recent times they only have a two-year lifespan. Oh. So I guess I'm feeding generations here, and I'm not <laughs> quite aware of when we when we go from one to the next. Anyway, they're all welcome. Uh, so one day, a couple of months ago, I go into my kitchen in the morning, and there, sitting on my stovetop, is the prettiest little thing I have ever, ever seen. And I had no idea what it was. It had white fur. And it had the most beautiful, I call them Mickey Mouse ears because they're so perfectly rounded. And they were jet black. And then there was a, a black spot that came down onto its face. Uh, and both ears, both ears were coal black with this beautiful white fur. And his darling little nose that was all pink. And he's looking at me and he's about the size of a, of a very big mouse. And I know it's not a mouse because its face isn't shaped right, but what in the world is it? And and I really had no idea. So I went over to the stove, and it's watching me with these intelligent black eyes. And I put my elbows on the stovetop, and I leaned over to him, and I said, 
who are you? <laughs> hey, where'd you come from? You're just the prettiest little thing I've ever seen. Where'd you come from, sweetheart? Well, what I was caught by when I talked to him was how his his eyes lit up. He was listening to every word I said. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So I called a couple of friends and explained what I had on, on my stove. And uh, then I Googled and tried to find an animal that looked like that. And then I realized, uh, some friend actually said, well, that's a um, possum. How'd they grow up to be so ugly when they start <laughs> out so precious? <laughs> so anyway, uh, I put a little dish on the stovetop and I put a... Uh, a jar cap up there. I filled the jar cap with water, and I filled a little dish with uh, with uh, dry cat food. And he sat there and ate. And I was fixing my. I was steaming something that had broccoli in it, and I dropped a piece of broccoli, and I leaned over and I handed it to him. And he took it with his little hand, and he ate it. <laughs> well, isn't that cute? So oh, I just. <laughs> I just started talking to him. I said, you know, you are so precious. You are so welcome, darling. Don't you have a mommy and a daddy and brothers and sisters? I mean, where'd you come from? Well, just about every time I came into the kitchen, if he wasn't already on the stove, I'd say, Peekaboo, where are you? And here he'd come clambering up a baker's rack that I had beside the stove. And he would climb up that and he would get onto the stove top. And so we would chat, and he would listen. One one day, I thought it was—it's really not adorable. I don't know why I think it's adorable. But on the very top shelf of the baker's rack was a butcher's block, and on it I had a plastic pitcher that was filled with straws. And I'd been doing something at the sink, and I always talk to Boo, you know, while I'm doing whatever I'm doing in there. And Boo listens. I see him crawling up the baker's tree. He's climbing up. He doesn't crawl. He climbs. He got up on top as high as he could get was on that butcher's block. And just very purposely, slowly, nudged it off until the pitcher fell on the floor with all the straws. (laughs) And then he perched there. And that became his place. I told him, well, now look what you've done. Look what you've done. It's straws all over. (laughs) And that became... That became his perch. But then I realized, I said, well, where, where does, I don't see any markings that he's been anywhere in the house. And I'm scared to think what that meant behind the refrigerator or the stove. And then one day I realized I met him coming out of the restroom downstairs here by my office. He was coming out and I was going in. And I said, well, Hello, how do you know about this room? <laughs> he was using the litter box. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I've, I've since found that there's something about a scent of a litter box. They will use it. Um, but I, my friends have all said he was watching the cats, and he wanted to be part of it, so he was doing what the cats did. Oh. And, yeah. Mm. And then just before he left, I had wondered how things on my bureau kept getting kind of moved around. I didn't equate it, certainly, to Boo. I mean, he's downstairs in the kitchen on my stovetop, or now on the baker's room. <clears throat> but one day I I saw him on the bureau in my bedroom. That means that little bitty baby crossed the kitchen and the dining room and went up a flight of stairs, crossed the loft upstairs, crossed my bedroom, figured out how to get on the bureau so that he would be close to the kitties that sleep with me at night. Oh. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. That shows a level of intelligence. Very, very, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you'd look in those eyes and not understand that he was communicating with you and listening Mm -hmm. intently to everything you said. Yeah. That was amazing. The cats, I, I, I was afraid the cats would hurt him because he was so little, but uh, they'd often be in, you know, in the kitchen eating at their dishes, and he'd be on the stovetop eating in his little dish. Neither one of them interested in the other. Isn't that something? Mm-mm. That's amazing. In which I said at our, our our opening that they always tend to wiggle their ways 
into our hearts. That they do. Oh, my gosh, yeah. yes. Yeah. They don't. Because it's illegal to have them, and I had to let go of him. Yeah, what a shame. I, I have to say, I cried. It took us two days to get, it, it put a trap out for him, which is just a, a, a cage. And where yeah. they go in the cage to get their food, the door closes behind them. It doesn't hurt them or anything. Well, the first time I heard it, I was in my office, and I heard the trap door. And I was so afraid he would get hurt or get scared, and I ran in there. Well, the trap door was shut, okay, and he was sitting on top of the cage looking at me like, what's this all about, lady? <laughs> That's too funny. But he did that two more times, you know, before he actually got caught in there. And, uh, it, and I cried while they took him away. But, of course, and, yeah. and uh, he he was with you long enough to have bonded with you. <clears throat> well, I think he bonded the first day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took mm -hmm. me a while. Yeah. Well, yeah, animals have uh, have long been a part of your life, and uh, we also understand that your daughter, Brooke, had a, a very wonderful dream of rescuing unwanted racehorses. Can you tell us oh, about that? Bless her heart. Thank you for even asking. God love her. She's had some traumatic things happen in her life, and... She decided to go back to school and get a degree in psychology. And she was just, I think, two credits short of it when she died. But she had started going. She was in uh, Kansas. She would drive into Kansas City and actually get on the trucks that were hauling away racehorses who were going to be put to death, become dog food or whatever they do with them later. She'd go onto the truck and buy them and lead them off and take them back to a, a farm that she rented, and she called it Serendipity Farms. These horses were in horrible condition, and she just absolutely loved them back to hell. There was one named Daisy who had stood in its own manure for so many years it had burned off almost all of its foot. Wow. And so it limped horribly. And Brooke said, Mama, my goal is for Daisy to be able to walk out into that field. Because Daisy, you know, limped horribly. And you could tell it was very painful for her to walk. And one day Brooke called me and said, Come over, Mama. i got something to show you. And Daisy was out in the field. So, those were, so she was taking the, going to become a psychologist so that she could work with emotionally disturbed children and combine it. Each child was to have be assigned an animal that was his to nurture back to health. <coughs> so uh, she just one night had an aneurysm and died very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that was the end. Mm -hmm. She had brought four racehorses, uh, two different buying trips, brought four back, and uh, she was successful with three. The other one had to be put down, which absolutely killed her. Sure. But, uh, yeah, you have to learn that that's part of love is letting go, too. Yeah. Well, despite the fact that her uh, dream was a short-lived one, um, Brooke definitely qualifies as a guardian angel to the animals. She's, she's up there. She's up there. Well, one of the things she had asked me when she was in her early 20s, uh, and I was working on Tarzan at that time, and I got to know their animal trainer. And uh, he also was teaching an animal class uh, by the, down in San Diego. And it had a great reputation. And, and she asked if it was possible that she could take that class. So well, she did. And she was learning to work with the big cats. One day she took a tiger for a walk. It was part of the assignment. She's out in a huge field, and she used to go over to the tiger and lead it to a certain post out in the field and then back again. And uh, Rick called me when it was over, and she said, I don't think I want to do this, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> that tiger looked at me, and I looked at it, and I thought, I don't care if you don't want to go. If you don't want to go, we won't go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. That was a short-lived career. She wanted to be an animal trainer, but she was better doing the things with the heart. Yeah, absolutely. And and Gary, 
You um, might want to tell uh, Esther a little bit about the uh, story that you researched uh, about uh, somebody who had a dream similar to Brooks, and that's Florence at Journey's End Animal Sanctuary. Mm, yes, well, um, <clears throat> Florence uh, started out with her husband uh, with, you know, just this little property, and, and they started taking in animals, um, and they had chickens and whatnot, and um, uh, eventually uh, what she decided to do with her property uh, was make it um, sort of a retirement home for animals. Um, animals that were no longer able to take care of themselves or, you know, were in poor health and people couldn't afford to take care of them. Didn't matter if they were horses, chickens, uh, goats, dogs, cats, whatever. Um, she would welcome them to her property. And uh, she made sure that uh, she still does to this day that those animals are there and taken care of until their final days and um, that they are always loved no matter what. And the great thing about uh her property is that uh, she has it open to the public. So I, I don't know uh, if that's the same now because of the pandemic, but uh, pre-pandemic, um, anybody who wanted to come was welcome to come. Donations were welcome, food, money, whatever. And um, all that she asked is that uh, the people just spend time with the animals and let them uh, be loved and be loved on. Where was she located? Uh, Deland, Florida. Journeys and, and people- <clears throat> Journeys and yes. Animal Sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And for any of our listeners who uh, feel uh, that they would like to uh, assist in that effort, they can Google that and find a way to donate. Uh, yes. Journeys and Journeys and Animal uh, Sanctuary. There was another one that you sent me a link to. Um, there was one uh, one woman. Oh, my gosh. What was the name of it? Do you recall? You sent me a link to it last week, and I followed it, and it was a journey's end. Um, I can see a picture of the lady so well. She has dark hair, and, oh, gosh, do you know who I mean? Was that Horse Haven? And they, too. Oh, that could be. Were taking, <clears throat> yeah, that could be the Horse Haven. Was, no, it was Forever Friends. That's what it was. Oh, our Forever Friends? Yes. Okay, yeah, that's one of the uh, documentaries that Gary's uh, oh, production yeah, yeah. company created. Yeah, that was... uh, And, uh, by the way, uh, Florence and Journey's End Animal Sanctuary are part of that Yeah, in fact, I think that's when we we met her, was when we worked on that project. And then Gary uh, (coughs) took, um, was involved with um, a graduate project at uh, Harvard, and he used uh, Journey's End Animal Sanctuary for his final... For my photo, photo essay, yeah. yeah it's cool. just, it's a wonderful place, and, <clears throat> and what she's done is has been amazing. And they just recently, um, they got quite a bit of money uh, that came in to redo restore a lot cat, of stuff. Restore the cat yeah. area. Get everything yeah. up to oh, date and up to marvelous. code, yeah. yeah. So, Esther, if you haven't... Uh, visited Journey's End Animal Sanctuary on the uh, web website. Yes, I, I did, last night. Oh, did yes. you? Okay, great. Yes, great. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. This is why I had asked you, uh, it's in DeLand, and when I lived in Florida, I looked for a house in DeLand, and I thought I'd covered, you know, the place pretty well, and I ended up in Mount Dora, and Florida is my home. So I thought I knew DeLand, but I had never heard of that. Mm-hmm. And I, gosh, how I wish I had known about it. This is why I started my company, for no other reason. There's nothing I need to do except I want to fund those who devote their lives to saving animals. And I promised a girlfriend who, the night before she died, she said, please use my child's profits from my children's books to fund animal rescue. And she knew that that was the only reason I was starting a company, was to go out and search for individuals who devote their life to rescuing animals and to fund them. I can't imagine starting a company just to rake in profits to enjoy in a bank. I can't imagine it. I I, yeah. I wouldn't get the, the energy to go to work one day if that was the goal. But if the purpose is to get the funding together to help these people who devote their lives to this, that's all worthwhile. Esther, oh, absolutely. How, uh, how do our listeners uh, find your company on the Internet? 
I did it again, didn't I? I self-promoted. I'm sorry. But this time it's for a good cause. It's, we have nothing to sell. It's by for the, the way, animals. Nothing to sell it's in, on, our, on our internet. So I want you to know that we're not trying to raise money from the public. Um, the sponsors, any profit from sponsorships uh, will always go to animals. But it's MojaveBeachProductions.com. And all of the podcasting that we do there is free for you to enjoy. We just hope enough of you enjoy it that the sponsors want to sponsor it so that we have the funds then to go out and do what we think is God's work, take care of the animals that people aren't taking care of. And for those of us, uh, for those of our listeners who might uh, speak English as a second language somewhere around the world, Mojave is spelled M O J A V E, Mojave Beach. Productions. Dot Thank com. you. It's, it is true. Even I spell it M O H. <laughs> and I go, no, 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 no. Yes. Thank you. Did I spell yeah. it correctly? You did. You <laughs> did. And I appreciate you doing that. Yes. Okay. My heart's pounding again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, listen, I'm well, looking at the website. Do you spell it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Do we have time to talk about uh, huh, attitudes toward animals? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's, little... let's end on that note. That'll be a good note. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, think this is a, I think this is a really good story. Uh, when my husband and I moved to San Diego, we were house hunting. And a realtor had told us to drive by a house, take a look at it. If we like what's on the outside, he'd give, him, give him a call. He'll come and bring the key, and he'll go inside. So we drive out to this home in San Diego, and it, it does look abandoned. We didn't see it, you know, all signs. Everything's grown up around it. It didn't look inhabited at all. So we're going. We're, you know, put our hands to our, our, hands to our face, and we're peering through the window. And all of a sudden... Here comes a Doberman pincher from around the corner of the house. He's running full speed, and man, he has got his fangs bared. Well, we had parked across the street, not in front of the house, but across the street at the curb. My husband turned around. He looked like Charlie Chaplin walking away. (laughs) He walked as fast as he could without running, and he said later the hair was standing up on the back of his neck, and he walked straight down the walk, across the street, got in the car, got in, rolled up the window, and then turned back to see how I was making it. <laughs> you left me there. He said, I, I couldn't protect you from a Doberman. He said, you know, I, I, I just, I just, you, I hope that you were okay. Well, we divorced. But anyway, not this. So I knew. <laughs> and he, he sure anyway. wasn't Errol Flynn, was he? <laughs> Not hardly. So here's this dog now, and he leaps at me with his fangs. Now, I know a lot about dogs. I've rescued dogs since I was a little girl, and I always have at least three rescued dogs in my home, always. I don't know anything about a Doberman. That's one breed I don't know anything about. I associate them with being guard dogs, but I don't know their personality. I Anyway, this guy was taking his job very seriously. He leaped at me, and I remember thinking, don't be afraid. They'll smell the fear. So I made myself stand perfectly still, and I made myself just get rid of any idea of fear because they will sense that, and they'll, they'll take you. So I just thought, just think love thoughts, and I thought, God love him, he's doing his job. And I said in the lowest voice I could manage, that's perfect, honey, that's perfect. Well, that dog began to circle me, as my husband could tell you, watching from behind the closed window in the car. (laughs) And as he circled (laughs) circled me, snarling, he would go, I, I didn't move. I stood perfectly still. I still worked with not having the adrenaline pump. I still worked on calming thoughts. And that dog would go around me and take a leap. Now, when he leaped at me from behind, I actually could feel his breath on on my back, on the back of my neck. He got that close that his jaws would snap. 
And I'd say, that's perfect, honey. That's just exactly. But I didn't move. Didn't move my hands or my head or anything. And I kept doing that. And his circles got closer and closer. And this is where Arby said he really got worried because the circles got very close. When they got very close, when he was in front of me, he was almost nose to nose with me when he would jump up and snap at me. He was right in my face. And again, I didn't do anything except when he got as close as he could get without actually taking me. I went very slowly down to my knees and I had on a skirt and I remember the skirt sort of billowed around me. And I stayed on my knees and I said, that's just exactly right, darling. That's what people want you to do is guard this property. You're so perfect. You're so beautiful. Just kept saying that without moving other than going down on my knees. Now he's eye level with me as he's going around and around. There was a place where there was no place else for him to go. He had closed in on me as tightly as he could. He was eye to eye with me. I'm on my knees. I'm looking him in the eye, which they tell you not to do with animals. And I said, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You're so perfect. That dog looked at me and lay down and rolled over on his back. Now, that's the surrender sound to the dog. That means I trust you. Yeah. And I knew better than make a move because he'd be back up on his feet and he'd hit me in a heartbeat. So I just looked at him and I said, you know, how beautiful he was again. I repeated that and how perfect he was in doing his job. And he started kind of wiggling around on his back, inviting me to pat him on the stomach. And I still wouldn't do it because I was afraid a move would change everything. Right. Until he wiggled around so that he looked at me again directly in the eyes. And I looked at him and I could tell it was a full invitation to, to rub his tummy. And I did. And when I did that, then he rolled over very gently and he began to lick my hand. And then I got up, and he trotted with me down the down the walkway across the street. When I got in the car, I leaned over, and I kissed him, and we nuzzled. And I got in the car and drove away. Wow. So, and then you divorced your husband the next day? <laughs> not the next day. I had to run to California to uh, L.A., remember? And then I ran out of asphalt and ended up working at CBS. But, um, yeah, that's the story of... Uh, I think that encompasses a story of animals. Sure. Because he did have a job. Now, if he'd mm-hmm. bitten me and somebody taken it to court, you know, that poor animal would have been put to death. Of course. That dog did exactly what he was told to do and trained to do and what he took seriously, mm-hmm. and that was guard the house. Mm-hmm. And if I had projected any fear or any defensive movement, mm-hmm. he would have. He would have, he would have bitten me because that was his job. I had to yeah. prove to him that I wasn't an enemy. Mm-hmm. I was not there to do harm to what he was given authority over. Right. I was actually uh, robbed at knife point in L.A. out on a highway when I had a flat tire. And when the man came at me, it was a knife. He was a young man. He was nineteen. Turned out. And I said to him, oh, my gosh, you know what this reminds me of? And he didn't answer me, but he looked at me like, what? I said, really, a really bad TV movie. Later, the police told me that there had been two murders in that place the the week before. And that what saved my life was that I I didn't yell. And he said something that applies to animals and to people. He said... No matter who the perpetrator is, they have a plan. They have something in mind. You're taken by surprise. You don't have a plan. Yeah. They have to be given permission to start. And you never gave him permission, which threw him for a total loop. And he left. Hmm. But you would have been dead if you'd screamed because that would have started it and he would have won. Well, it was the same way with the dog. If I had been defensive or put up any defensive gestures, that would have been the end because that would have meant I'm the enemy. I'm, I'm the one you fight. Right. I don't know. I just threw that other one in. I hope you don't mind. No, <laughs> but it makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. whatever you put out there, whatever energy you put out there is what's received by person or animal. You know, when you think about it, communication is the basis for 
everything, uh, everything that we deal with everything. in life. Yeah. 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 And effective c- communication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, talking about uh, you have to approach them with a certain frame of mind, um, even if you don't truly feel it, if you understand that that's what you need to do and you kind of fake it till you make it. <laughs> then that's what you need to do. Or your first instinct is always going to be defensive, I think. Or if it's with yeah. a child and you don't know how to communicate, but your first your first line of defense is to separate yourself from it because you don't know how to handle it. And yeah. I think it's the same with just people in general. You know, if, if uh, somebody comes at you with attitude or frustration or whatever, you know, it's easy to jump to a first conclusion uh, instead of stopping and saying, hey, I'm not sure what's going on with this person today, but, you know, they may have had it rough before they got here or they may have been through a situation, but I don't need to yeah. escalate it or I'm, whatever. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. After I separated from Arby, I stayed in San Diego uh, for a while, and uh, I had to take the bus to work. And one day I got on the bus, and this bus driver was slamming on the brakes when he'd pull up to pick up somebody at the curb he would get or the tire would get up on the curb and it would bounce everybody around that was inside and everybody on on the bus was just grouching, you know, what the what the devil's wrong with him and blah blah blah. Right. And I I was looking at him in his rearview mirror and or you know, that mirror up over there. I guess that's the rear view mirror. Anyway I was looking at him, and he was frowning, and you could tell he was really having a bad day. Yeah. So when I reached my stop, he bounced up on the curb you know, with a tire and slammed to a stop, and everybody lurches forward. And I went to the front, not the back where you get out. And I right. leaned over to him, and I said, honey, whatever it is, it will pass, sweetheart. It will. Mm-hmm. And I got off the bus. And, man... A moment later, he's standing beside me, and he gave me a big hug, and he said, thank you so much. Yeah. (laughs) And that was that. But you know, when somebody cuts me off on the road or tries to get ahead of me at the grocery line, I remember when I first came to this decision, because I used to get so mad in L.A. traffic, they cut me off, and I tell myself, I'll bet he just got a call and his daughter's been taken to the emergency room. Mm-hmm. And I tell myself that now every time anybody tries to cut me off or get ahead of me, yeah. I don't know what their motive is. And they don't have a way to tell me. Exactly. Let it go. Give Let them go. the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Because they may have gotten a call that some loved one is in an emergency room. Or you don't know. Absolutely. A few feet you would gain by trying to be first. A few feet you would gain. You have no idea what that few feet might mean to them. It certainly doesn't mean that much to you. Sure. Well, Esther Luttrell, you are definitely not only an animal lover, but a people lover. And we have absolutely appreciated you being with us this evening on the Incredible Stories podcast. Well, I'm really honored and flattered that you would bother because you tackle such wonderful subjects and you do everything with such integrity. And I just thank you so much for letting me be part of it, even for the little while we're together. Thank you. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Thank you again. And so with that, Gary, um, should we leave with fake it till you make it? or I like that. <laughs> fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. I love that one. All That's right. a good one. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And this was an incredible story.